Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. In case you've never heard me say it before, this podcast is free. I don't monetize it, so I don't make any money out of it. And importantly, I don't ask you to spend any money on it. So none of my content is behind a paywall. And I have the philosophy that if I've got a story or a guest has a story, it should be heard by as many people as possible, regardless of whether or not they've got any money to spend on it. In exchange for that, all I ask for is that you, if you enjoy it at least, if you hit the like button, leave a comment, share it with somebody who's like-minded. If you're on YouTube, then go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell button. And if you're listening to the podcast version, then please do leave a review of the channel because that helps me to build my audience. For today's episode, we're back with Star Baby Pachuca, and he's going to explain what it's all about in just a second. But before you dive in, I just wanted to say that I recorded this while I was away, which means that I didn't have all the different audio tracks and I haven't been able to get the audio I was going to say to my usual high standards, but I know that audio is not my strength. Um, But to the usual standards of the channel, that's probably the best way of describing it. But that doesn't detract from the fact this is a fantastic episode, and I'm pretty sure there's nothing else that's quite like it anywhere else on the internet. Anyway, I'll stop talking and leave you to enjoy. Mike Petruca, uh, call sign is Star Baby. Um, I come from a wild weasel background, turned strike eagle guy, turned light attack guy with some time as an irregular warfare dude in the middle. Um, and so what I'm going to play is actually what may very well be the first shots of the second Gulf War. Um, and the context is in the no-fly zone, northern no-fly zone in 1998. And we've got mostly my combat video. Um, but some of it from the other jets interspersed. And I'll talk through everything. We're basically taking advantage of the fact that this is a YouTube channel and not just a podcast. So we've got the opportunity to use some video of something that's not me staring into a camera and trying to look uh, skinny, Uh, because that's what we all do when we try to stare into the camera. Um, So let me just, we're gonna, we're gonna, the audience is gonna have to bear with us with some degree of good humor because really I suck at this. Um, And uh, we're gonna play with various tools. So let's start with Google Earth. And what we have is the Northern portion of Iraq, the way it was in 1998. So off to the west of the map where you can't actually see it um, is Insulik Air Base. And that's where we would fly out of, we'd fly across Turkey Okay, and into Iraq. And this is, despite the label, it's Iraq. And the important things in Iraq are, for our purposes, the first is this red line. That's the 36th parallel. And north of the 36th parallel was the first no-fly zone. This was established immediately after the Gulf War um, because Saddam's forces were were massacred. And So the second important thing is the green line and north and east of the green line are the Kurdish held areas and west of the green line are the Arab held areas, okay, which was of course the Iraqi government. And so we were set up to try and preserve as much as we could um, of the Kurdish areas north and east of the green line. The center is a town of Mosul, which you've no doubt heard about. Uh, The town of Mosul is a big Arab city. It was taken over by ISIS uh, a number of years ago, and eventually the Iraqis fought their way back and reoccupied it. But this is long before those exciting events, and it's the biggest city in northern Iraq. It is also the center of the fourth air defense sector, which was the first of Iraq's four air defense sectors to reconstitute itself after the first Gulf War. Why did it reconstitute itself? Because we were flying up over the northern no-fly zone, and the Iraqis wanted their air defenses back. So the purpose of the no-fly zones, which started with uh, Operation Provide Comfort, they were actually undeclared at first. Um, And what's not widely known is that even after the ceasefire, after Desert Storm, uh, F-15 light gray eagles were killing Iraqi fighter jets north of the 36th parallel after the ceasefire because they would come up, they would do something aggressive and the eagles would splash them. 
But uh, with Provide Comfort being a humanitarian effort, uh, we got support from UN resolutions declared a no-fly zone. And the rule was if an airplane came north of that red line, uh, we were authorized to shoot him down. Now, really, that was fast jet airplane. Um, although we could shoot attack helicopters, if a transport wandered north, we weren't going to do that. But it, it, didn't, it didn't happen. Um, so you had to be a fast mover, really, in order to uh, be considered to be breaking the no-fly zone. So what we had at Insulic was a composite wing. Now, a composite wing, a normal U.S. Air Force fighter wing, mostly consists of one type of aircraft. You have an F-16 wing. Uh, you have some wings that have two. Um, and at the moment, Royal Air Force Lake and Heath actually has three. They have light gray F-15s, they have dark gray F-15Es, and they have F-30 fives, um, which are transitioning in and as the light grays phase out. So eventually it'll go back to two airplanes. But a composite wing and an ex is a normal structure for an expeditionary wing. And uh, really ours was a joint task force. So we had strike eagles um, and we had light gray eagles and we had F-16s and we had Navy or Marine Corps prowlers and we had tankers and we had AWACS and we had Royal Air Force uh, tornadoes. And up until 1996, when it was still provide comfort, we had French Air Force uh, Mirage F1s. Uh, key aside, the French are great guys to deploy with because they get issued one bottle of red wine per person per day, and even they can't drink it all. So once a month, there is a French party uh, in which uh, everybody puts, tries to put down large quantities of red wine. Um, largely unsuccessfully because the only people that can drink that stuff in quantity are the French. Um, so that was, uh, uh, that was the way it was structured by the, the French left when we turned it into Northern Watch because the humanitarian effort was, uh, was over and it was left with uh, a British and a US operation. The way this started in December of 1998 was that we had the composite wing in Insulic, and it's really a combined task force led by uh, Brigadier General Dave Deptula, call sign Zaytar, uh, who was a great combined task force commander. He's a light gray guy. Um, we've got a whole bunch of air crew who have been there over and over again, enforcing this no fly zone for the last seven or eight years. And very talented. We knew the area, and honestly, we're bored to tears. The northern no-fly zone was a banker's hour no-fly zone. We only enforced it four to six hours a day, maybe four or five days a week, because we didn't bother to, to enforce it on Thursday or Friday because the Iraqis didn't fly on Thursdays or Fridays because it's their weekend. And we didn't bother to enforce it when it was dark because it was dark and um, why bother? And we didn't bother to enforce it any time the Turkish Air Force wanted to bomb the Kurds because they wouldn't let us. So really, and we didn't enforce it on uh, major events like Super Bowl Sunday, Christmas, or Thanksgiving. Really, Super Bowl Sunday, even in the South, we, the Air Force left the Super Bowl Sunday uh, to the Navy to enforce. It was a general stand down on the Air Force side. Um, so we're up there. We're at a good location. Um, it's a full up American base, um, plenty of internationals. We go out on the economy and this is the gentleman's no fly zone. And in December of 1998, the Clinton administration decided um, that the Iraqis had not been forthcoming enough on the weapons inspections regime that they would fire a bunch of cruise missiles in an operation called Desert Fox. So cruise missiles went into Baghdad, they hit like Republican Guard headquarters. In short, they hit kind of symbolic targets. It had no effect whatsoever on whether or not the Iraqis were going to get back into the weapons inspection regime. Um, but they were buildings that probably wouldn't uh, kill a bunch of civilians and they might even enjoy seeing them drop. But the problem was during Desert Fox, which went on for a week to 10 days, all overflights in northern Iraq were canceled. And that meant that we had no overflight, which meant no reconnaissance, which means no current intelligence. And the way this breaks down is we're going to zoom into the center of northern Iraq. Mosul, the IOC, the Interceptor Operations Center, that's where the fourth, uh, there's actually a sector operations center 
uh, which is located in the same place, that's where the northern air defense sector is controlled from. And there were typically a couple of SAM sites that would be around. And most of them stuck around Mosul, occasionally one up by Saddam Dam. So these are all former locations of where the SA-3 might have been in the time. And that's what a normal air defense laydown would look like. Green sites would be active, black sites might be inactive former sites. The pink site was a decoy. Um, you know, we've got a fairly decent density plus your random SA-3 out to the west, uh, south of the dam. There was also a couple of Roland, which are French made uh, short range air defense systems. We usually flew above those. Uh, and then a couple of SA-2s just to add into the mix, which are longer range. So oh, that's kind of can, what our air defense network looks like. So, so sorry to interrupt you, but can you just give some, you might not be able to give the actual figures, but, but sort of indicative figures for the ranges of those systems against you guys flying at 25,000 feet then? How far can they reach out and, and get you? Ah, that's a good question. So if you were an SA-2, you would reach out roughly 25 nautical miles. Okay, and up to 100,000 feet. This was the SAM system that uh, did so much damage to the US uh, Air Force in Vietnam. And if you were an SA-3, your circle would be a lot smaller. That's based on the Northern SA-3. That's the one we're gonna talk about. And you reach out about 12 miles. Now these are, the SA-2 is a big missile. Okay, it's called a flying telephone pole, uh, well over Mach 2, really big warhead, uh, not terrifically agile, but agile enough uh, if you're not maneuvering. The SA-3 is smaller, shorter range, much more agile and significantly faster. An SA-3 coming off the rail is easily a Mach 3 missile. It's And Mach 3 is freaking fast. And you don't really understand what fast is until you see an SA-3 come off the rail and your radar warning gear is cooking. That's fast. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, very shortly. So that's kind of what the ranges look like. Now let's compare to um, what the Strike Eagles got on board. So this is a no-fly zone. And so we're carrying six air-to-air -air missiles, two AIM-120s, which are active air-to-air -air missiles, advanced medium range air-to-air -air missile, really great missile. Two AIM-7s, two AIM modernized AIM-7s. These are big semi-active radar homing, meaning they don't have their own radar in the nose like the AMRAM. They got off the reflected energy from our radar that's bouncing off the target. Now, the advantage of the AIM-7 is it's a big missile with a very, very nice warhead. Um, and we like those. I really like AIM-7s a lot. The other thing about AIM-7s is you can call them back. Meaning if any time in the time of flight, you drop the lock, you drop the missile guidance and the missile goes stupid. So it's not like AMRAM. AMRAM goes off and it's going to do its job regardless of whether or not you maintain your radar contact. It's going to give it its best shot. And the last two missiles are the AIM-9s. AIM-9 Sidewinders, short range. I mean, short range by comparison. You can still shoot a target you can't actually see with a naked eye. Uh, these are dogfight missiles, highly maneuverable heat seekers. Um, and heat seekers at this point in time in the 90s, it wasn't just for going after your tail plume. You could shoot a guy in the lips uh, with a heat seeking missile. Uh, and that, that was a regular thing, especially in training. So six air to air missiles, 510 rounds for the gun. We've got a six barrel 20 millimeter Gatling cannon. Um, and because we're strike eagles, we can also carry bombs. So we're carrying two GBU 12s. Now, the GBU 12 is a 500 pound laser guided bomb. And the way a laser guided bomb works is just like the AIM-7 only in lasers. So uh, think of a laser pointer. You've got your laser pointer, you wanna mess with the cat, you point it against the wall and the cat guides on that reflected spot. Okay, it sees the reflected spot on the wall and immediately focuses on it. That's what a laser guided bomb does, except that instead of just being any laser spot, each uh, laser beam is actually coded. So before you hop in the airplane, you crawl underneath the bomb and you take a screwdriver and you set your four digit laser code, which is not the same as your wingman's four digit laser code, which is not the same as number three or four's laser codes. 
so that when you drop these bombs, they're pretty much coded to your designator and not any designator that happens to be out there. Um, we have a big old radar in the nose, the APG-70, uh, which has both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground functions. Um, and we have uh, a lantern navigation pod, which has a train-following radar and a forward-looking infrared. And then we have the targeting pod, which is where the laser is. That, that also looks in infrared and narrow and, and uh, wide fields of view. And we'll see all of that. So for the moment, what have I left off that I need to talk about before we start this fight and I tell you where I was? What about ROE? Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. That's a great question. So the over the years, the Air Force officers that ran this engagement zone had become more and more timid. And so we got to the point where we didn't necessarily even fly inside that, those smaller circles around Mosul, because if we flew there, somebody might shoot at us. And if they shot at us and we got shot down, some Brigadier General might actually have a career impact. So they became more and more risk averse and we spent less and less time uh, flying in the circle. Um, and with the absence of the F-4Gs, uh, that meant we had F-16s for seed who do not quite have the all around look that, a, that an F-4G had. So F-4Gs would regularly just go through the middle of the ring trolling for SAMs. Uh, the F-16s uh, would position themselves differently, use a different set of tactics driven by their, their systems, but we kind of stayed out. And now we're in a Desert Fox situation where you can't really avoid the SAMs if you don't have any reconnaissance and you don't know where they are. So General Deptula changed the rules and he said, look, here's the deal. If you're fired on, you're authorized to return fire. Okay, that sounds totally reasonable. And it was. And so the rules of engagement were changed. If we were engaged by an Iraqi air defense unit, we could return fire against that. And we didn't necessarily need to even ask him. Okay, that was the big change, the rules of engagement. So down to the south of the image, which I'm not going to show, but right around where my little moving hand is, uh, for those of you watching on an iPhone, you're kind of out of luck. Um, but just take the big red bullseye spot and go south, you know, about three quarters of the way down the screen. That's Kiara West. And Kiara West Airfield is where the Iraqi Mirage F1s went. And so those are the guys we're always pointing our radar at. And so when you look at where we're going to set up a combat air patrol, we're going to, the combat air patrol is uh, a racetrack kind of orbit, looks like a big oval. Um, and we're pointing north-south. Okay, so when we're north, we're running away from the air base. And when you're south, you're running towards it. And that's where your radar are on. And you're just desperately hoping, because this is so boring that somebody's going to take off, get lost, and cross the red line. And, you know, in 1994, Brian Baxley and I, and uh, hopefully Brian and I will be back on a, on a future uh, event, uh, we were in uh, an F4G, and we had a guy just come north as if he were go to the, to the, cross the line, and we were the closest to ship. We had an F-16 on our wing, um, but we had the, the F-16 at the time didn't have AMRAM. So here we are, our F-4 with our two AIM-7s waiting for this guy to break line. I've got, you know, an early radar contact and he just, he's messing with us. He turns west before he crosses the red line and gives us the big finger and there's nothing we can do about it. So I'm still riding on that kind of excitement, which happened in 1994. Here it's late 1998. I know something can happen. Maybe someday, God, I hope I'm airborne when it happens. Boy, wouldn't that suck if I were on the ground? Okay, you guys get the idea. All right, so that is Coors 1 and Coors 2. Now let's talk about call signs. In Desert Storm, the... Uh, guys that got to the mission planning for actually it was Desert Shield, who got there first, got to pick the call signs. So there were a couple of things. Uh, Beagle Keck. Beagle Keck was a weasel Ewo. was the first weasel to get there. And Beagle got his call sign because he can, no kidding, bark like a dog. The first time I heard him, I thought somebody had left a dog loose in the squadron. And Beagle says that the weasels are going to take the beer call signs. Okay, we'll be Coors, Lone Star, Bud, et cetera. The Eagles, who had always been like sharks or something cool, they said, we're going to take the gas station call signs like Shell or Exxon 
because um, previously the tankers had always taken the gas station call sign. So the Eagles were hoping that somebody would home in on their call sign and send somebody thinking they were getting into it, going after a tanker and run into a wall of Eagles. Meanwhile, the tankers got the shark and the Mako and the Barracuda call signs. The EF 111s took tools. Uh, F 111s were tools, various like hammer, um, driver. Their favorite was ratchet because, uh, uh, you know, like your little ratchet socket set, because the Arabs mostly cannot pronounce ratchet and it comes out as ratchet. So you are always ratchet 3 2. And for some reason, the F-111 guys really dug that. Okay, so when it came time to, to do call signs for this particular uh, uh, deployment, I was on the, the mission planning cell and I just stole weasel, former weasel call signs from eight years prior, right? So I took Coors and Bud and Lone Star and the, the F-16s had Demon and Devil and the Prowlers had things like Bobo, Whacker and Harley. So I'm not quite sure if they got a load of bad MREs or what, um, but they had their call signs and um, AWACS was always Cougar. So here's Cores 1 and 2 and we're running, as I said, North and South. And- Are you two strike eagles? We're two strike eagles. Two strike eagles. Yep. We have another two ship that is Bud 1 and 2. Um, and where does the Bud One and Two is actually off? You see the lake, that's Saddam Lake. They're north of the lake, and I should be bringing up a position, but I'm not. Oh, they're way north of it. Okay, so Bud One and Two are way north. So the clouds had been a low cloud layer, so we called off the tornadoes because the photo reconnaissance pack wasn't going to see through clouds. So there's no sense flying them over Mosul. Um, and we let them go and there had been two more strike eagles out here, but they'd gone home because they were only uh, scheduled for a short time. The clouds are beginning to clear out. You know, it's a nice sunny afternoon, um, still kind of a broken cloud deck and the F-16s, um, good on them, decide to stick their nose into this center SA-3 ring and see what happens. Well, what happens is the Iraqis decide to shoot at somebody, but do they decide to shoot at the F-16s who are ducking in to the ring? No, they decide to shoot at Coors 1 or 2. Turns out to be Coors 1. That would be me and Bat Cross. And here we are, you know, hanging it out, flying through the middle of the circle, up and down and waiting for a fighter, and the radar warning gear goes off. And we get a flashing circle three, and it's like an SA-3 missile launch. And so what do we do? We run the fuck away. That's what we do. <laughs> so what happens with the radar warning is we actually have both jets get it, which is some of the vagaries of radar warning. The missiles uh, are definitely pointed at us, but Bud 2, way up here in the north, he also gets missile warning. So both flights go defensive. Bud 1 and 2 go west, Cores one and two go east. We both make a defensive call at exactly the same time. You know, uh, Cores one, defensive, mud three, bullseye, 350, 23 nautical miles, eastbound, defensive. That's a defensive call. And that's pretty much what I called. Bud two makes the same call. And he also, because he needs to get light, he jettisons his external fuel tanks. So he, he donates them to uh, Northern Iraq and they turn away but it becomes very clear in short order who they're actually targeting. We have turned east and now we're blasting east. We are nose down, supersonic, sonic, busting through the mock and the first two missiles come off the rail. Now, in contrast to our really good, you know, defensive calls, the F-16s start chatting, chatting amongst themselves on the common radio frequency. And it's like, Sam, Sam launch, where? You're two o'clock. No references, no call signs, just a couple of dudes, you know, on voice chat uh, with a little bit of adrenaline kicking it into a higher pitch. And that does nothing for us. So what actually happens is we have probably, uh, we, I mean, Bat and I, no kidding, we guessed. We guessed where the missile was because we didn't have good direction. 
we guessed that it had to be somewhere around Mosul. So turn away from Mosul, step one. Go supersonic, step two. We've done those. And then I catch sight of the missile, probably the second shot, high between our tails, because I'm looking behind us, uh, and it is well behind us. It goes high and it uh, self-destructs some distance behind us. I don't know how far behind us, but behind an, uh, far enough behind us that I was not in imminent danger of wetting myself. I don't know if that's a specific criterion, but uh, 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 it is a criterion, so we'll use it. Um, and now, now things are happening. You know, shots have been taken. Uh, we've run away. We've uh, outrun the shot. And Chorus 2, our wingman, Chorus 2 is feeling untargeted because he's untargeted. And so what he's got time to do is figure out which of these possible sites shot the missile. And it turns out he calls it as site number 44. We had numbered all these. And he says, site number 44, man. And it's like, awesome. And he passes that over the voice radio and we start pulling it up on the radar. Now, unfortunately, all of this excitement was not caught on tape because at this time, 1998, the Strike Eagles had a three quarter inch, that's Betamax, um, which went out before most of your listeners were born, I suspect. Um, and it only had 30 minutes of tape. And so we didn't run it unless something important happened because most, I mean, otherwise you run it when you cross over into Turkey, you got to save that for when things are actually exploding. Uh, like if you shoot an airplane down, you want to have the tape available. Okay, what the studio audience can't see is we just spent three minutes unscrewing the computer. Um, so we're going to get rid of the other stuff. And we're going to roll this sucker. And I'm going to stop and explain what's going on uh, and what the various things you're looking at are. OK, so this, what is this? This is a bunch of blurry stuff because we're in a turn. We've just started the tape. Now, this tape suffers from the fact that it was three quarter inch transitioned to VHS digitized um, using a fairly imperfect methodology. But it's still a decent representation of what's going on. So what we see on this screen is we've got the crosshairs. The crosshairs are going to be very important because that's where the laser points. Up in the upper left, we have a data block. In the upper right, we have target uh, coordinates uh, and elevation of where the crosshairs are pointed. Um, and I'll explain the other things as we go on. But the important part is that there's these things as subtitles. So if you see subtitles on the left, and here you see UHF-1, SA-3 site, and Cougar, that means it's coming over the strike primary frequency and everybody can hear it. If that block is in the right side, the lower right window, then that's over the, the F-15 interflight and only the F-15 cores and bud flight can hear it. And then if it's down in the center in red, um, that's Bat Cross and I talking on the intercom. So, And is your UHF encrypted? Are you using KY-58, whatever it's called? No, no. If we were using KY-58, we'd have all died. Um, KY-58 is a, is a Vietnam-era technology overlaid on a KY-28, which is a Korean-era technology, and it doesn't work well at all, uh, and is completely unusable tactically. But what we do have is HaveQuick, um, and HaveQuick is a frequency hopping scheme intended to be anti-jam. Uh, and so you'll hear a bunch of clicks and some broken. That's because we're hopping X number of times per second. We treat that as if it's secure radio, even though it's not because it's not encrypted. But you have to have really good tech in order to unpack uh, have quick even after the fact. So something the Iraqis didn't have. Um, so they could not listen in on a have quick freak. Um, all right, let's work. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the screen. Let's talk about that call. The call is from Bat, who's in the front seat, uh, says, hey, I want to uh, request permission for an immediate attack. Bat knows we don't need authorization. We've already got it. But he knows that I have just turned on the tape because before I hit the button, I said, tape's coming. 
So he's getting this all for the record. Okay, the rules of engagement allow us to strike back. What we have now is we have a split screen. So my targeting pot is on the right and that is in thermal, white is hot. On the left side, we have a normal camera, uh, which is you know, a black and white camera as far as everybody else is concerned. It actually has color in it, but not on the tape. Um, and that's the heads up display. So it's got our heading, uh, the, the circle is what we call an ASC circle. The little W in the middle is where the nose is pointing, the air speeds, those three digits on the left in knots. Uh, the altitude in feet is the five digit box on the right. That long ladder that goes up and down is called the pitch ladder and it's always perpendicular to the ground. Um, and we'll point out a couple more things, but that's what the heads up display looks like. And we're filming both that, the fact that we had the film and I knew where bullseye was is how I was able to reconstruct this, um, knowing where everybody was. Uh, and it really took till Google Earth before I could complete the reconstruction. On the right side, you don't see the crosshairs. Um, my pointer off to the left is a little box that tells you where the targeting pot is pointed relative to my airplane. So it's pointed straight out my left wing. And I don't have a crosshairs because whenever the crosshairs disappear, the laser can't fire there. Um, so it doesn't bounce off like the fuel tank and blind somebody. Um, but this little puff of smoke, that is the booster smoke from an SA-3. Turns out that the SA-3, which is a two-stage missile, that the booster smoke is highly visible in the infrared. Very unfortunate for some individuals on the ground who probably <laughs> didn't know that any more than we didn't know that. Um, and so that is like shooting at somebody and holding up a big flashing sign that says, hey, here I am, what you gonna do about it? So we've got that. And like I said, uh, our wingman had uh, had located actually the coordinates for the site. So now we're looking at this booster smoke and it's a fairly low wind day on the surface. So it's going to hang around. So it's you know kind of like, hey, in case you missed me the first time, I'm still right here. So at this point, Harley, one of our prowlers, says the missile guidance is still on the air. The SAM that, that Bat is referring to that's going eastbound is actually a third shot. We have no idea what the third shot was taken on, um, but there was a third shot before I got the tape on. I wish I'd had the tape on earlier. You could have seen it launch. Uh, that's going to be the last SAM shot uh, of, uh, of the moment. So let's roll. Uh, the Prowler's call empty, or sorry, the F-16's call empty, meaning they've got nothing on their, uh, uh, their harm targeting system. Um, somebody calls it there, Tally the SAM, uh, our wingman, uh, course two says, I've got a designation on the smoke launch site. That means that he's put the crosshairs over the target, he squeezed the trigger, and he's now told the computer that's your target. Uh, I say same, I'm lying to him, but I'm going to have a designation in a minute. I've got it visually. It's just a matter of working through the uh, the sequence and getting a good field of view. So now I make the call, uh, cameras on, okay? We get, now everybody's got to get their cameras on because stuff is going to happen. Roll call. So the AWACS comes back, says attack is approved, deed is approved, roll call. And what he's doing with the roll call is we have a lineup card that we always take up with. It's got every member of the flight listed. Okay. And so they go through in the order and the flight lead acknowledges for the flight. Um, you know, bear, salty, etc. You all go down in the order. It happens that fast. That's the best roll call you will ever hear. Everybody acknowledges that we are now approved to attack. AWACS knows because we've called it back. So this, if you remember Star Wars, Star Wars, original movie, X-Wings, Y-Wings are going to go in. They're going to try and hit a little precision target with a non-precision weapon uh, as if it's a womp rat in Beggar's Canyon. Um, 
on the Death Star and they decide to check in and they do it in a random order. Red 12 checking in, Red 5 checking in, Red 7 checking in. I hate that. I hated it then. I hate it more now. The way you do a check-in is you say red flight check and you hear one, two, three, four, up to 12. And that's it. Red flight check complete. Okay. That's how you do a check-in. George Lucas, take notice. Um, I actually have a transcript where I've completely reworked the whole Star Wars end battle scene to actually use proper brevity comm. I have you. Uh, yeah, because it's the kind of thing I do. Um, it was actually an illustrative point to show how uh, it, it literally had a reason was it was for a seminar to show how much information you can get across with little bits of information where people already knew the Star Wars scene, right? So they knew it was going on. They knew who had been saying everything. Now, when I show you the how you use actual tactical comm, it's like, oh, yeah, you can do this in a lot less time. Okay, well, that's, that's going to be another episode then for us. You, you've oh, got to talk well, us through that. Uh, totally. So I totally do that rebattle, but I want readers. Okay. I want, I want different people to take different roles. Um, maybe you could ask your viewers to volunteer. Yeah, we could do that. We could arrange and that. And do this as an audience participation thing where everybody gets oh, a role. Brilliant. That would rock. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll make it happen. Um, yes, yeah, so that'll be fun. And uh, how we're going to do it with the background and get away with that, I leave to... Uh, the lead, which would be you. All right, so the right scope now says designate. I put the crosshairs over the base of the smoke. I've squeezed the target. That's giving my computer a rough idea. We are 34.6 miles away from the target. It's only a rough idea. If I drop bombs on that kind of loose coordinate, I'm going to miss, but we'll get there. All right, so now we pause the tape because I realize nothing's going to happen right now. I've been running the tape for two minutes. I better turn it off. So I got 28 minutes left for the good stuff. So we're switching to Core 02, uh, the wingman, because his tape is still running. what just happened that's a check on the aux that's cores and bud flight so while we're two separate flights we're kind of going to form up as a single flight so we're referring to bud one and two as three and four um dave dodger uh, uh sorry dave dodge call sign dodger is the flight lead for uh, bud one um and so he is uh, uh he's the the voice that you just heard but what he's saying is Number four has 17.5 and number three has 26.6. Those are thousands of pounds of gas. So strike eagles, gas, love gas. There's, you know, aviation, jet fuel, that's, that's the thing, man. So strike eagles, lots of it. 26,600 pounds is what number three has, which is about what we have. And number four has 17.5. Why does he have so much less gas? Because he blew his wing tanks uh during the initial defensive maneuver so he's a little short on gas but he's not too short to participate so we're gonna we're gonna keep going because we still have tankers he can always post strike we can always divert into a turkish base but he's got plenty of gas to wreck help us wreck this sam site and fly back to insulik no problem hey, you can, uh, be involved in that. Uh, 
pause it. We don't have data link in 1998. So pause it is just a, where are you? And we call out bearing and range from the bullseye. So if you remember the map, we had that bullseye in the middle of the red line. We're always talking about our position relative to bullseye. And if you look at the lower right in the screen right now, we see 327 for 37. That means that we're three. if you draw a line at a bullseye, you go 327 degrees on the compass for 37 nautical miles. That's where um, the airplane is. And so the reason we do this is even on a clear frequency, you don't want to announce where your position is, uh, but we don't tell the enemy what the bullseye is. And in theory, it should rotate every day. It doesn't. This bullseye stayed static for years. Um, but it's still very difficult to deal with if you're not, um, if you don't have everything set up. The other thing I'll point of note is for situational awareness, there's this little north up arrow. So whenever you're looking at the pod, you've got this little arrow in the end that points towards north to help you figure out where the heck you are. Because when you get sucked into the screen, you can lose a lot of situational awareness. And there's some great tools on the screen to help you get it back. Just for the reference, you're looking at a five inch diagonal monochrome green screen. Okay, the backseater has two of them. And typically the targeting pod is on the right one. So you're saying to yourself, or your viewers are saying, Boy, this resolution sucks. Yeah, sure does. It's 640 by 480. Okay, and that's what you've got. Okay, break in tape. Now we've gotten our act together. We're in position, and I turn my tape on again. And because I made the tape compilation, I get to pick my tape. You hear a lot of comm chatter. We've got multiple things going on inside and outside the cockpit. You know, I just tell Bud to uh, bat up front to uh, 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 check left, and we're going to map, use the radar map. What you also saw was the plan. Okay, the plan just came across who's going to take pets on the two and the three. So it's not just the SA-3 that shot at us. We know that there are other SAMs in there, but they're not currently on the air. So with the harm shooters, our F-16 guys, and our prowlers, Navy and Marine Corps prowlers, they're going to take preemptive shots. And a preemptive shot throws a harm in the air with an address book and says, if you see somebody that you don't like, um, guide on them. So the advantage of that shot is that if a radar comes on the air, there's already a harm in flight looking for them. So a harm is an anti-radiation missile. So if you think of it as a radar beam is turning on a flashlight in a smoke-filled bar, you can see where the flashlight's coming from. You see the beam. The harm sees that and will actually ride the radar beam down the antenna. So the advantage of the preemptive shot is you get a shot in the air that's already in flight. The disadvantage is they almost never hit. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because the, they call it defense suppression for a reason. You're trying to suppress the defenses. And if somebody knows there's a harm in the air, they will often not turn their radar on. So to say that it that those shots mostly miss is an unkind way of saying they mostly do their job. Now on the right, we have the radar map. And I'm going to take some radar maps, and people are going to look at those. And they're going to say they suck. These are amazing. Okay, The synthetic aperture radar map on the strike eagle at the time was the best thing we'd ever put in a fighter. Not great resolution. Um, limited windows that you can map, uh, limited size, but it didn't matter. It shows radar significant stuff and it was freaking awesome. And that's how we're going to start the ball game. Because one of the things we know is what are SAM radars made of? Metal. What does metal do with radar? It reflects it. 
do same antennas have an, uh, the same systems have antennas? Yes, they do. And so antennas are even better reflectors than normal metal structure because that's their job. And it just so happens that the SA3 is in the same frequency band as a whole lot of airborne radars. So that means that it's designed to re-radiate energy in the band that I'm throwing at it. Uh, it's gonna be the best thing ever very shortly. But what it's gonna look like to people who aren't used to looking at this, it's gonna look like a bright spot in the middle of the radar. And you're gonna say, what's that? This is just a ball. This is just a glob of white snot scattered on the kitchen table. And I'm gonna say, no, that's a radar. Man, is that ugly, okay? But that 44 in the middle, that's where the computer thinks the, the, the nav computer thinks the target is. It's not there because I don't have GPS. I've got an inertial navigation system that wanders about a nautical mile per hour. So I'm gonna have to find this myself and I'm gonna look for bright stuff. That bright mass at the top of the right screen, that is a village. Uh, and we know it's not in a village because we saw that cloud of smoke. So we're gonna look for bright spots along roads and you can just barely see some dark lines radiating from the village, those are roads. Oh, look, a bright spot next to the road. Done. 12 seconds, radar mapping, took three maps, designated the target off the radar. That designation I can now draw free fall munitions on. And I say to Bat up front, your radar, I'm done. He can have the radar back and he's going to keep it in an air to air mode. And we are, I'm going to drive in and now I'm sucked into the targeting pod. All right, now we're getting ready to rock. And somebody in the background is setting off a car alarm. So what do we have on the left? The left, we now have a vertical line, which is the azimuth steering line. And that is the computer telling the pilot, hey, center up uh, on this line and I will drag you over the target. On the right side, I've got the village, which is this dark blob and a dark line going down, which is the road. And now I'm looking for the SAM site but I am 30 miles away with a 480 by 640 camera in narrow field of view at 1.3 degrees. And I'm not gonna see a SAM site at this range, but I will, and we'll get there. Check master arms. It would be embarrassing to fly all the way there and hit the pickle button and realize that your master arm was still in safe. So let's not do that. We're going to make several master arm calls because after getting your tapes on, that's the big mistake you don't want to make because it will change your call sign and you will forever be embarrassed by that little bit of switch error. So we have the plan, okay? We're coming in from one direction, three and four, bud flight coming in from a slightly different direction. Uh, a number of degrees off. The F-16s and Prowlers, uh, Prowlers will put the jamming on. Both flights are going to shoot harms at specified targets. They know what time we're going to be there. And now we're rocking. We are inbound. And... Uh, <laughs> All 
almost a peach. What the hell does that mean? What it means is that Intel guys have this obsession about code words for normal things that they put on our cards. And um, they want us to talk in code words, which they will change every day because that's good communication security. Unfortunately, what it means is when it comes to time to use a code word, you have no idea what that code word means. And you have to come out of the cockpit, look down at your kneeboard and figure it out. So Bat's gonna be good. He's gonna call the peach, which means we're entering a threat ring. And whatever he says, I'm fine with. Yeah, Peach, whatever. That means whatever. Because everybody else who now is here, Peach, now they have to come out of what they're doing, look at the card and go back and say, oh, he means entering a threat ring. When you could just say entering a threat ring. Um, this was particularly absurd in Bosnia a couple of years prior in the in mid 90s is that um, when we, when aircraft in the no-fly zones were illuminated by radars, the Intel guys wanted us to use code words. When you're illuminated by a radar, you don't have time to look at your code word. So we started calling the SAMs fireflies. And because we number them all, like SA2, SA3, SA6, we would simply say firefly six. And that said to everybody, SA6, you only had to remember one word, firefly, it was good. It made the Intel guys happy because we were using code words. It made the aviators happy because we didn't have to screw with whatever happened to be written on our cards. But here we are, peach, almost a peach. What is a peach? Like I have time to figure out what a peach is. I don't have time to figure out what a peach is. We sound like Darth Vader because we're on 100% oxygen. Whenever you're on 100% oxygen, you sound like Darth Vader. We go to 100% oxygen anytime we feel like it um, because we falsely believed at the time that it was like a performance enhancer. Uh, it's not. It actually causes physiological issues. What it does do at night is it gives you better color vision, but it's not night. So we're doing nothing but breathing heavily. But now that everybody has the plan, you notice how quiet the radios are. The radios are kind of reserved for if somebody has a crisis. Bat knows we're cleared to release. He also knows the tape is running. So we got it all. Now it's on the tape. We are cleared to release. The Combined Forces Air Component Commander has approved it. TOT is time over target. We're going to be there at 2900. Now, what we've got is my radar designation. Now, remember, I said that the pilot has the radar. So he's looking and using it for air to air. But what you, would the system have the memory to actually freeze my air to ground image and save it for me? So that's what I've done. I've got this saved image. Now, normally with a laser guided bomb, you have a picture of the target. You take off with a picture, you study the picture beforehand, and that's how you're going to figure out what you're going to hit. Well, we didn't know we were going to hit the SAMs. I don't have a picture of this target, um, but I've got my radar map. So I'm going to use my radar map as if it's a picture on the run-in, and that's why you're going to see me flipping back and forth. I'm not taking a new map. I'm looking at the old map because I, I want a picture. We're naked, that's a great call. What we're naked means is there's nothing on our radar warning gear. So you're gonna hear several nakeds and that's all good on the way in. But Bat knows that we're now taking a knife to a gunfight, 12 mile SA-3 range with an SA-2 in Overwatch and probably another SA-3 uh, floating around. And our bomb range is about, oh, five miles. So we're going to have to go well inside the threat range in order to engage. But you'll see on the left, Pat is, uh, that Bat is S-turning us back and forth. And it, as he reverses the turn, you hear a little burst of static as we dump chaff, uh, which is little aluminized hairs that make a radar blob. Because we know that the SA-3 operator has to twiddle one knob to get us an elevation. He has to twiddle a separate knob looking at a separate screen to get us an azimuth. 
And we're not going to make it easy for him by just pointing at the guy. Uh, we're going to S turn our way in so that he has to twiddle both knobs and we're going to put globs of radar goo on his scope uh, to make it that much more difficult uh, during the run in. Uh, but the SA3, what we know about is um, he can only take one target and there's four of us. So the normal plan would be that if you get lit up, you go defensive and the guys that are not lit up uh, press to the target. Magnum 2, first harm in the air. Actually, full confession, I have no idea that Bat is S-turning. Okay, we are, he is moving the airplane. We're in 85 degrees of right bank. There's G on. I have no idea this is happening. I have a target to find. I am 17.3 miles from the target. I'm moving above at somewhere around eight to nine miles per minute. I got a limited amount of time to find this. Oh, you sure? Can I just ask about the, the pod and the tracking then? So are you, is the patch map queuing the pod? Because it looks like it's not tracking anything. Are you having to manually, is it ground stabilized? It's ground stabilized because when I designated the target with the radar, I now give a, a I generate a point, a 3D point that the pod is stabilized to. And so you saw a little, a couple frames ago, you saw me swing the pod left and then re-queue it to make sure I was looking at the point that I thought I was looking at. So that's just your normal check is swing the pot off, thumb aft and bring it back to queue to make sure that uh, you're looking in the right area. Um, but it is ground stabilized. And so the pod ball is rolling around and giving me this nice vertical picture while bats, you know, moving us through the sky in an unpredictable manner. Um, hence, that's why I, I'm unaware of the aggressiveness of these maneuvers. Objects, but no ID. I've got various little blobs in the scope um, where the radar designation was, but I don't have an identification. Now, when you when you go against a radar like the SA-3, you need to kill either the radar or the control van on the run in. Okay? Otherwise, the guy's going to shoot you in the back. So as a contingency, we normally briefed. Uh, priorities are radar, control van, launchers in that order. When in doubt, hit the radar. If anybody was in doubt as to what their priority should be or what they could find, just hit the radar uh, and we'll go from there because otherwise we're going to get shot in the back. You can now start to see little dark blobs. Okay, and I'm looking at the farthest blob. Why am I looking at the farthest blob? Because the laser guided bomb has no propulsion. It's released ballistically when the computer says it should release. So if I pick a target on the far side of the SAM array and I suddenly realize the thing I want to hit is on the near side, then I can drag the crosshairs closer to me and the bomb will simply steepen up. But if I do it the other way around, the bomb, if I were to designate the near side, the bomb only has the energy to get to the near side of that target. If I want to then pick an aim point on the far side, the bomb has not got the energy to make it there. So I'm looking at the far side of the target and I'm moving my crosshairs off because we're looking at a couple pixel wide black spots and my crosshairs are a couple of pixels wide. So you can tell by looking at a crosshairs what the guy running the pod is thinking about, but the actual target is not necessarily directly underneath it. 
So if you look at a modern system like the uh, Bayraktar, the Turkish, they don't have crosshairs. They've got a square so that you can look in the middle of the square and see what the guy's thinking about. All right, so up here in the upper left is my range. That's how I know when I say I'm 17 point something miles away. We're now 13.1 miles away, and now the laser is bouncing off the target. And so it changes on my display to feet. So I'm 79,000 feet from the target, and I'm getting good laser reflections uh, from something in the area. So I'm feeling pretty good. And as Bat says, we're naked. So if you want to know how far away we are from the target, it's in the upper left block. Magnum three, harm shot in the air against an SA three. Now you can see the black dots. Now, which black dot am I going to pick? Which black dot is the important black dot? The low blow radar for the SA three is 38 feet tall. Okay, I'm going to pick the object with the longest shadow. Can you see the? Can you see the shadow? Sure can. Um, it's okay. tough to tell here, but it's basically at the bottom of the crosshair vertical line and slightly left is a guy with the longest shadow. You'll see it uh -huh. when I designate him. Yeah, one of the neat things about former Soviet systems is that when the Germans reunified, all those former Soviet systems suddenly became German systems. And so we set them up on training ranges in Europe. So I had actually had the opportunity to operate several former Soviet SAM systems with former East German instructors, which was great. Whoops. We're about nine miles out and Wacker just says, no missile, and it's going to get worse in a second. Got a hung missile. Guys tried to shoot the missile. It didn't come off the rail, and it's still hanging there. That's an instant in-flight emergency, particularly when the thing that is hung has a rocket motor that you've told to ignite and has not ignited. Um, so now that that means not only does this guy have a problem, but he has not gotten a shot on the two and Harley comes on the radio and says, hey, I've got a shot on the three. Well, great, who's suppressing my two? And the answer is nobody. So I'm still looking long at the target. I've just redesignated. Okay, now that I'm bouncing a laser off the target with a pod, I've got a really solid designation. The computer now knows exactly where that guy is, but I'm still working at the far side of the array. Now you see the shadow? The shadows are all running from the center to the lower right of the scope. Yeah. Longest shadow. Now, Wacker has a shot on the Two is off hot, Bud two's bombs away. We have three strike eagles. Bombs are off in an eight second time frame. Um, as you can see, we're not flying directly over the target. That's bad because what we call bomb activated anti-aircraft fire. If a bomb explodes, you shoot straight up. Don't be the airplane that's straight up. So as you can see that little square, the bracket, where now the pod is pointing off our right front of our airplane because we've turned left. Uh, and so we're not gonna be over the top and we're gonna maintain some distance. Uh, right here, T impact tells you the time till impact, which is 27 seconds, flashing laser, L means, which you can't see at the moment because it's in the off part of the flash, means the laser is firing. And at about the 14 second point, I'm going to feel like I've got time to smoke a Lucky. And that means it's time for Shakespeare. Yeah. 
little bit from Merchant to Venice, but I truncated the quote because I only had a couple of seconds. I got chewed out for this after this. I got chewed out for this before the next war. I got told before Allied Force, no Shakespeare on the tape. So I had to settle for writing it on the bombs with a paint pen. like after you put six laser guided bombs on it so what happened with our wingman is he was 17 seconds behind us and let me end the screen sharing so our wingman was 17 seconds behind us he releases the bomb he had actually designated the control van exactly as briefed and is lazing in on the control van and decides that he isn't sure it's a control van so he switches his target to the radar, exactly as briefed. His, suddenly the radar explodes. He does not realize that he's got 17 seconds left on his timer. Those are my bombs that he's seeing explode. And two seconds after that, the bomb from Bud 2 hits the same aim point and turns you know, bigger fragments into even smaller fragments. So totally, you know, guys on target. And our, our wingman, now his laser spot is lost in the explosion. But through the luck of the draw, since he designated the radar in the first place and the computer dropped the bomb as if it wanted to hit the radar ballistically, and it's a low wind day, two laser guided bombs without laser guidance sailed down from 24,000 feet and shacked the control van 17 seconds after uh, the radar explodes. And so as he, as the backseater said at the time, I'd rather be lucky than good. And uh, it totally worked out. But yeah, I mean, here was a guy who did everything right. Um, you know, a great wingman support. Well, we were defensive on the targeting, picked his priorities, switched when necessary. Once all that sand got kicked up, his laser guided bomb was done. And, but because he'd done everything right with the radar designation and then later the pod designation, the bod bombs hit what we needed it to hit anyway, even without guidance. So what happened after this is we go one way, the other flight goes the other way, we head north, we're done, man. Uh, we have met the intent of the rules of engagement, we're now out of bombs, we're low on, on gas, and uh, we're leaving, we're done for the day. Gentlemen's rules, man. And uh, so we cross into the Turkish border and I take my hands off the hand controllers where they've been welded for the last 40 minutes, except when I turn the tape on and off and I realize that they're shaken. I am swimming in adrenaline backwash uh, and I'm still obviously pumped. So it's a long 50 minute flight home to Instalic Air Base. And uh, you know, it's great. We passed the word, the word is passed. And you know, the first guy to meet us when we land is actually the Turkish airman who is tasked with making sure every day that we land with the same number of bombs that we took off with. And so four of us in the D-arm area, four strike eagles, he comes to check the bomb. He looks at the first, no bombs. Looks at the second airplane, no bombs. Looks at the third airplane, still has his bombs. Looks at the fourth airplane, no bombs and no external wing tanks. And so we're watching all this happen as this guy with a clipboard watches, walks back and forth in front of the airplane, looking at the unimaginable that the Americans had actually dropped some bombs and no doubt confused by the fact that we were all mismatched. And as I said before, Bud One could not positively ID the target. So he kept his bombs, which is exactly what he should have done. So General Deptula uh, met each of the crews at the aircraft when they shut down. Uh, we got our tapes and then he took them to brief the intelligence and maintenance guys to show them what the outcome was so they understood how critical their role was. Uh, and then um, 
we put it all together on VHS and released it to CNN immediately that day to prove that the Iraqis had shot first. So I made CNN International. So the first thing my mom hears about this whole engagement is watching CNN and hear my voice go splash, splash when two bombs hit an SA-3. So that was totally cool. And needless to say, I have VHS recordings of that stuff too. So that's what an engagement looks like. Um, that's ad hoc, well-trained crews um, from uh, you know, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Navy, and if we'd had the RAF the, uh, still around, it would have sounded exactly the same um, because we all talk the same language, we train together, uh, and we, we showed up not expecting a fight, but when a fight uh, developed, uh, we put a plan together on the fly, uh, and we certainly didn't start the fight, but we did end it. I was going to ask you about the, the planning side of things then. So you, you didn't have a playbook that you picked a move from, um, which de determined who was going to come in, what the timings were going to be. You actually dynamically did that in the air before you turned the tapes on. Ah, yes and no. We didn't call the play because the play was obvious because we did have a playbook. Um, and one of the advantages the Strike Eagles had in the late 90s is they'd gotten a lot of the weasel crews. Um, transition from the F4G was retired in 1996. So we're still in the sweet spot when all of the Strike Eagle squadrons had some solid weasel knowledge. So what, what the weasel crews had added to the Strike Eagle community was a bunch of attacks that you executed if you had to bomb a SAM. Uh, and so this was uh, a split attack, you know, by elements coming in from two different directions. And we didn't have to say it. It was, that's what we were going to do. And we knew it because we had practiced it over uh, England uh, innumerable times uh, against simulated uh, SAM sites. What's the tolerance, uh, Stabo? And again, you might not be able to talk actual figures, but, but you know, ballpark tolerance in terms of your TOT and those preemptive harm shots still being in the air, because presumably, well, not presumably, for sure, they don't stay in the air forever. So how much time do you have in terms of being able to go and hit the target, knowing that those harms are still in the air to take out any radars that come online while you're doing that? Uh, so it depends on what range uh, the shot is taken at. Um, and we've got a pretty good idea of the profile. So in this particular set of conditions, I'd consider a harm to be protective for between 60 and 90 seconds. Um, I'm totally wagging it here. Um, there, by, there is almost certainly a planning table developed by somebody at Naval Weapons Center China Lake in 1979 that tells you exactly how long you cover when you shoot from what range um, and what profile. But none of us had any of that. We just had to wag it. So we told everybody our time over target was 29.29. So, uh, uh, or 2900 is what we eventually, so 29 minutes past the hour and everybody figures it out on the fly when they need to put a missile in the air to cover us. And they're going to assume that we don't need to be covered on the way out. They're going to assume when I call 2900, that SAM site explodes one way or another. Uh, and if we, but the, the defense suppression guys and the Vipers, they're not shooting all their missiles. They're holding shots in reserve. They are fully prepared to engage in a protective shot if we were engaged by another battery on the way out. So that's why the TOT is hugely important. So that means that everybody was going to be pointing at the target when we hit 29 seconds with a weapon selected and a target list up ready to hammer down if they needed to hammer down. There's a ton of thermal blooming, isn't there, when those things go off, particularly with the older lantern pod, I think it's the AOQ. 13 isn't it the, uh, yeah. the the actual target pod and I, I know that's improved these days with things like sniper but how would you have dealt with or how would the wingmen have dealt with that thermal blooming um is it by condensing the the timings of their bombs hitting the ground to within a couple of seconds because presumably they're seeing the same thing and they it washes out the screen they won't know what they're going to hit otherwise it does now what you're seeing in this case is not thermal bloom but dust and debris Okay. Um, so thermal bloom is worse in higher humidity. It lasts longer in humidity. 
Um, what really blocks you out is either a secondary explosion, which causes much more thermal bloom over time, uh, or if you collapse a building and you get a cloud of concrete dust. Um, we didn't know any of that, okay? Because when we drop live munitions at Nellis, we drop it against like the Mount Helen airfield, which is just looks like a moonscape because so many live munitions are on it. We don't see the after effects of live ordnance because we don't build concrete buildings out on a range and then go and explode them and learn about concrete dust. There's only one way to learn about it and that's the hard way. So for everybody in this, this was our first live combat drop um, of live ordnance. And we knew that there were gonna be some issues. So we were trying to get the timing as close as possible. Um, so you try and get as close to simultaneous as possible. And really everybody across the target in 17 seconds is pretty good. When it came later to Kosovo, there were certain targets we had to hit, which took some real planning where you had to put the bombs uh, all within a two second time period. I also noticed from the video, you, you laze quite early. Um, well, it seems early, I think it was you know, 20 odd seconds you were, you were lazing from four. Um, is there a reason for lazing so soon? Does that not sort of drag the bomb off of a, a ballistic profile, um, drag it lower because that, it's sort of hunting for the, the reflected energy of that laser? Yeah, so this is an argument that goes back to the F-111 days on ballistic release point versus optimum release point and delayed lays versus constant lays. So the reason I'm lazing far out, the bombs are still on the airplane. Okay, so it doesn't matter what they see or don't see. Um, I'm lazing it because the SA-3 has an old style TV camera. Um, and that I'm hoping that uh, the laser will interfere with the photo detector on that camera if he's pointing it in my direction. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know if that would work. I've never tested it. Um, I, there, uh, there are reasons to believe that it will work, particularly against older systems. So if you take another look at the tape, what you'll see is prior to bomb release, I shut the laser off. I let the bombs release, I let them fall for a little while, and then I turn the designator on specifically to avoid what you mentioned. But the fact that they'd been released probably on, a, on the far designation and not the near one I made you know, four seconds prior um, means that they probably had excess energy and I needed to uh, you know, bring them into the target anyway. But yes, it's all technique. Um, I normally delay lays. Um, I was bitten once in a, in a simulated bomb drop because my laser button failed. And so later there was a software change to allow you to program in an automatic laze time. So I always had that programmed in so that in the event that my laser button failed, which of course it was never going to do again, <laughs> that the automatic system would turn the laser on and save me in the end game just through a little bit of preparation. Did any of the other SAM sites come up then, the SA-2 uh, uh, providing Overwatch and that potentially the SA-3 to the West, did, did any of them come up during the attack? Were you naked Not the a peep. And there was one other SA-3. So I didn't find this until the reconstruction because I've got access to, to the full length tapes, which shows that what we were mapping on the radar beforehand. Um, and so it wasn't until I went through man, probably in 2014, when I realized that none of us had accounted for a, an additional SAM site that we should have known was there. So there was one more SA-3 than, than we thought there was and we executed the plan. Would we have changed the plan? No. Okay, all it would have done was made us that much more tense. So no big deal. And what about BDA? Obviously, there's there's some immediate BDA, BDA there in the sense that you can see the target exploding. Um, but do you, does it, did Intel come back to you at any point and, and actually confirm what you what was damaged or what's what's happened to the site? Has it been a, a completely sort of taken off air for a couple of weeks? Are they just going to replace the radar and the uh, the you know the, the control van? What, what what feedback do you get after the raid? After the mission. Ah, so I didn't need any feedback at that time. But in this case, remember, we didn't have any good re uh, reconnaissance. So we would have needed to task airborne reconnaissance. What I suspect happened, because this suddenly came out of the blue, 
um, is that somebody got uh, we, another national asset was tasked to take a look at the bomb craters. Um, and that was probably classified at too high a level to even tell us about. So that's what I suspect happened. Um, but with the video from all four airplanes, you know, uh, we had pretty high confidence that that was our built in BDA. Um, I had a one of the SAMs I, I dropped on in Serbia. Um, it was actually a U-2 radar pass that pretty much gave us confirmation um, that we'd hit something uh, because the, the sensors picked up the debris field. Really? Wow. You were, what, how long did you stay in the Strike Eagle Corps after this? This was 98. When did you leave the, the airplane? This was 1998 and I left it in November of 1999. So at this point, okay. I was actually doing remarkably well. You know, I was the wing EWO. I was from my squadron. I was a company grade officer of the year. Um, and suddenly I got an assignment, um, you know, to go fly prowlers with the Navy. And that completely derailed my Air Force career. My point was at the time that if I wanted to fly for the Navy, I would have joined the Navy. And I didn't graduate number one in my class to fly an airplane with a pointy end in the back. So um, that was kind of it, except that um, what I ended up doing is going into Allied Force right after in 1999 and flying you know, a couple dozen combat missions there and dropping a whole bunch of ordnance. So really, my last year as a captain was awesome. And because I had a separation date, because I declined the Prowler assignment, I was actually passed over for major um, right there in the middle of a combat operation. And if you get passed over, it's traditional that you get a day off, you know, so you can go get blasted. Um, but, you know, I was the only guy with a definitely promote passed over because I had a separation date and they gave it to somebody else. So I ended up getting my promotion in the air guard afterwards in which I pinned on sooner than I would have pinned on if I'd gotten promoted on time in the regular forces. That was an accident, but it's another story. You kept, because you retired as a colonel, didn't you? I did. Yeah. So, yes, I was passed but, over for major early to lieutenant colonel, passed over for colonel, made colonel, you know, retired at 32 years. Um, yeah. Again, there's the aspect of being rather be lucky than good. Um, but well, I do the, have an unusual record. The reason, the reason I was asking how long you'd stayed in the airplane after that was because you made reference when you were talking through the video, you made reference to GPS and to the importance of, of your, your patch mapping process. And I just wondered whether or not with the advent of the EGI, the embedded GPS INS that they put into the Strike Eagle, then I guess at some point in the early 2000s, whether that meant that actually the requirement to do things like patch mapping became less important, whether or not those... Because even though you make it sound simple, you know, just look for the the, the blob in the middle of the screen, there's, there must be a, a huge amount of interpretation that goes into it. You know, it's probably a bit like anything that requires dedication, sport, whatever, you know, watch people play tennis, it looks easy, but then you pick up a, a racket and a ball and you find out actually it's not that easy. So you make it sound easy, but it, but I wonder whether or not other technology came in that would to replace some of the skills that you had built because of a lack of a capabilities in other areas. What we, there, there's a hierarchy in the Strike Eagle on the quality of your designation. So um, you're usually going to go through the sequence and try and make it one step better all the time. Um, and so, you know, what you really want is you want to bounce a laser off the target and designate it then because that beats anything. You know, four of a kind beats three of a kind. Um, so what the, GPS would have done for us, what the EGI would have done for us in that time frame is it would have made my initial target acquisition much easier because I wouldn't have had eight tenths of a nautical mile of drift when I snapped my first radar map. The radar map would have come up, come up cued. But one of the things we'd seen from Allied Force is I watched a guy drop 2,000 pounders on a ski chalet because his GPS had cued high and it was a Viper guy, so we didn't have a radar to fix this problem. So what he saw as he came in was because his GPS cue was high, his line of sight overshot the near ridge where his target was and went to the far ridge where a building that looked very similar to his target was. 
And so he overshoots the communications relay and drops bombs on a ski chalet because his GPS cue was high. Had he had the ability, which he didn't, you know, this is a guy who's screwed by his own systems. Had he had the ability to go from GPS cue to radar patch map to laser designation, he would have caught that error at the radar stage. Was, it, was there anything about the tape that you played, the, the, the strike that you played, that you would, uh, you sort of debriefed as an item for, for, for sort of changing or doing differently next time? Was there any element of that that uh, you looked at afterwards and thought you would do it differently? No. So it was perfect? It was as close to perfect as you have a reason to expect in a fight. Um, you know, and I have I have briefed this tape. I have given seminars on this tape. I have gone over this strike. I have reconstructed it from all four aircraft points of view at various spatial time and arrangements in 3D. And we just did this one right. Did you get? You said you got a, a, an adrenaline rush from that. Um, did you get the same in the other sorties you've flown? You flew because I think you said you flew sixty. Did you say you flew 60 combat sorties or, or Southern Watch sorties, Northern Watch sorties in the F4G as well? Uh, yeah, so Did I got about 80 in the, in the F4G. And, so, so uh, were, were they all the same then in terms of the adrenaline rush and the shaking hands? Uh, was there was that, that peculiar to this one for some reason? Because no, you man, this was on a something? Sam kill. This was a Sam kill unambiguously um, with laser guided bombs. And I'd said as a weasel guy, I am never gonna drop hard, hard ordnance on a SAM because that's just dumb. Well, that's great when you're a guy with a great sensor system that has a harm missile underneath the wing and you can afford to say, I'm never gonna drop hard ordnance. When you're a strike eagle guy, you don't have that sensor system and you don't have the harm. All you've got is free fall munitions and you go with free fall munitions. Um, so no, um, this, was, uh, this was just, a really intense combat experience where it went well. And, you know, you, I'd been under threat. We were, we were taking our knives to a gunfight, but it had all come out all right. And of course the adrenal gland doesn't go through the same mental processes, man. It just dumps hormones in your bloodstream and says, hey, I'm still ready to rock. I'm still ready to rock. I'm still ready to rock. And so, uh, no, I cannot remember ever taking my hands off co uh, hand controllers and realize that I was shaking in the backwash other than that time. Were you, was, there a, was there an element of, were you consciously fearful at any point then during that engagement? Nope. Not a bit, man. I was a weasel guy at a strike heel. I was born to do this stuff, which of course is not true. I was born to dribble on myself and breastfeed. Um, but uh, which I did as a child, um, the dribbling anyway. And so uh, I, I, this was kind of the bit where I lost the imposter syndrome. Okay, this was the, yes, I missed the Gulf War, but it doesn't fucking matter anymore because I killed an SA-3 the hard way. Bite me. That's kind of what I'm coming out of. And the person I'm addressing is myself. You know, I'm just addressing that other part of my brain. Tell me a, a bit more about the, the Shakespeare then. All right, so Merchant of Venice, uh, Shylock, who is Jewish, is uh, talking near the end of the play. By the way, it's a crappy play. Everybody in it's an ass. Okay, but Shylock is pointing out, um, he says, um, he's talking about that there is no, just because he's Jewish doesn't mean he's not human. Um, tickle us, do we not laugh? Prick us, do we not bleed? Poison us, do we not die? Wrong us, shall we not revenge? And so that seemed like that was the quote I needed, but I needed to shorten it up. So it was just prick us, do not bleed, wrong us shall we not revenge is what I got out because that's it. Wrong us, shall we not revenge? It worked. Had it been earlier, I might've said something like cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. But 
um, you know, I didn't have that going for me at that time. It's once the bombs are released and all I had to do was laze them onto their target. And I had 34 seconds to think about what was going to happen next and realize that there was nothing else I could do but keep the crosshairs. Well, you know, might as well get something on tape. <laughs> had you thought about doing that before? Was it completely spontaneous? Was there uh, a sort of, a, obviously you, you said you afterwards, you were, you were sort of, you know, sort of uh, told off for, for, for doing that as so you wrote it on the bomb. So you did it afterwards. But up until that point, had you thought about that before? I must have thought about it. There's there 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 must have been some kind of um, no fly zone fantasy where you knew you were recording for CNN and you wanted to say something. Um, did they get so, so did the whole audio go out to CNN then? Because normally what they do with these things is they release some of the the video, block out the sensitive bits, and take all the audio away. But yeah, they released so that, it with that that tape because you're watching the same tape we released to CNN, only we didn't have the subtitles added. Um, that was all unclassified and they got it. Full audio, the last 30 seconds of all the, uh, of three out of the four aircraft. And so the one they played on CNN, if you listen to the background where commentators talking over it, uh, on a couple of the clips, you can hear it. And nobody said a word. It was more like, you know, it, it was this playground competition. Well, who shot first? The Iraqis claim you shot first. Well, we've got booster smoke that proves that you shot first. Let's well, not booster smoke. It's like, yeah, it is. So you've got all this conversation going. And it, it was a slow news day. And, you know, we hadn't, we'd only fired cruise missiles in Iraq for a while. And they didn't come with combat video. So this was, you know, a good 48 hours of arguments and excitements and talking heads on uh television to give it the shot but no they got the same audio you did which is probably why i got the word from my squadron commander and allied force is no shakespeare on the tape talk, talk to me a bit about the booster smoke then was that because it's really curious to know that that had not been discovered up until that point that it had a good ir signature because you would have thought through the course of i don't know what would it have been 91 to 98 seven years of, of stuff happening in iraq and and sam launches and america's own exploitation efforts of, of foreign systems um obviously live weapons are, are more difficult to get hold of than you know a radar band but you would have thought that would have been understood so was this new in the sense that they were using some kind of new booster type rocket propellant nope it's it's almost certainly an entirely stock system a solid rocket booster followed by a uh, red fuming nitrogen fueled uh, second stage um, and it was just that i think nobody had caught it on tape because if you look at the gulf war we talk about precision munitions but the f117s uh, dropped a lot of precision munitions and the f111s nobody else had the the designation systems. They didn't have the tape running. You know, we, we would have had to have tapes running with limited tape times when somebody actually shot off. I built a threat guide in the late 90s. And one of the things I had trouble putting together was that I was trying to put together was what does a shot look like? What color is the smoke? What do you see? This was all Vietnam era stuff um, that we should have known, but had been lost in the revisions of the tactical manuals over the years and i had to reconstruct it now i can go on the youtube and you know i now know what an sa8 sounds like because ukrainian sa8s and guys with cell phones uh yeah and you know i didn't realize that there was a pop before the rocket motor kicked off but it's really cool so it was information that had not been captured and disseminated um we were just in a position where you know, we got it on the tape and it was IR significant under those conditions in that day. Uh, That's an interesting, it's an interesting topic. Is it, do you know, do you know Hacker Haskin? No. Randy Haskin. So he, he's a striking guy, a former striking guy, but he, so he was out there in March uh, 2003 for Iraqi freedom and he got shot at at night. And he said to me, he knew what it was, um, not by the raw, because I think it was, what do you call it? Uncorrelated? I don't know if it, I don't know if you yes, actually had an indication. It was uncorrelated. Um, but because he saw it at night, so he said it was the, the sort of donut 
black sort of center with a ring of flame around the outside. That's how he also knew it was coming towards him, but by the color of the, of the rocket flume. Uh, so that's how he knew what it was, because apparently the different uh, the different motors or the different boosters have slightly different colored flames. So it's interesting that you were sort of trying to put that together. And I, I guess you could then infer at some point in between your efforts in 2003 that there was something put together that gave them that kind of detail, that gave them that kind of information. Yes. And so, you know, I put the threat guide together for the strike, the strike eagle specific and all the strike eagle wings ended up using it as a reference document. It was in all the yeah. weapon shops. Um, and then I think accidentally that showed a template for what what information was missing from our manuals. And so guys did the research and re-added the stuff in. Um, so no doubt. I mean, the, the problem with it, the advantage of flying at night is that you see every missile shot. The disadvantage is you think every missile shot is coming towards you um, initially uh, until you see it move sideways, line of sight. If you're seeing a donut, it's definitely coming your way and you need to do something about it. Yeah. Well, Star Baby, that's been a real treat, a real um, a, a nice change of pace from the usual sit down and listen to guys talk. It's been really interesting to, to listen to you talk through uh, and narrate through the tape. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Um, yes. Yeah, so this was a, a, a good time. I'm glad to talk about it. I hope uh, people enjoy the what I did on my winter vacation from 1998. Uh, and we'll I'll look forward to the next thing that you come up with. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.